Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Thomas. Tonight we're back here with Josh Scorcher. This just uploaded today. It's the top 10 recurring bosses. So these are bosses you see, I mean, pretty sure you see over and over again, whether for reasons or not. But yeah, the ones I could think of are Bowser, Dr. Ragman, uh, Ganon. Let's see who else. Um, hmm. Okay. I mean, other than that, I don't know. Uh, Ifrit, maybe? Final Fantasy? Well, we're about to find out, so let's just hop in and see what boss actually made the most appearances. Be sure to like Scott for more, hope you enjoy it, let's go! Let's go. How many times do we have to teach you this Ugh, lesson, old man. man? Sometimes a boss in a video game refuses to die or just leave you alone. It mm. could be because if it's the story, the developers think it's funny, they're coasting on nostalgia, or they're out of ideas. So we'll what see. makes an effective recurring boss? Well, when they return, their presence should get us excited and in awe. If the boss returns so much that it's tiring or groan-inducing, they lose points. So your Bowsers, Ganons, Wileys, and Junkos won't be showing up on the list anytime soon. Ideally, really? it Junko should feel count? like the boss is Junko growing stronger and learning new I mean, skills alongside the player. At well, minimum, a turns, boss must return at least enough. three times to qualify. Also, mm -hmm. ideally, it should be done over the course of a single game, but throughout a franchise can also count. Also, this okay. might surprise you. There are oddly few repeat entries on this list. Gotta balance things out somehow. Fair. Okay, I'm... Okay. Let's see. First up! I've talked a few times about Easy, huh, yeah. so I figured it's about time to talk about or... its sister series, The Legend oh, of Heroes. Of Heroes. Another long-running yeah, JRPG series that's older than I am that no one has heard of, <laughs> yet that kind of reminds me of another franchise with a similar name. Hmm. Though, hmm. unlike Ease, Zelda. which has been ripping off Zelda, this series rips off, I don't know, Grandia or Lunar. Has anyone else heard of those? I don't care. Mm -hmm. What I specifically want to talk about is the Trails part of the series that's been running since 2006 with Trails in the Sky. Now, there are a lot of things I could say about Trails, but the one thing that you need to take away is that the series' world building and overarching story make Kingdom Hearts seem like a nursery rhyme. Each really? game builds upon the last to make a current 12 game saga that shows 12? no sign of slowing down. Characters and moments that show up in games 2 and 3 will affect story elements in games 11 and 12. Don't worry if you forgot about said moments. Half of uh, each game's runtime is devoted to reminding you of said moments. Oh, did I mention okay. that every game from game 2 forward takes 60 plus hours to finish? And you guys thought Kingdom Hearts was hard to get into. Considering the scope of the whole series, you can Fair expect enough. to see many familiar faces throughout the franchise. And yeah, you do. That's why our number 10 entry isn't a single recurring boss, it's all of them. All of them! All, all of them. them! Well, at least all of the story's important bosses. This series loves making every fight enemies that you fought earlier in the series or even the same game multiple times to show the point where I can make a literal top 30 from the series alone. It's mostly there just to show off the power levels of the enemies compared to your own level, and by fighting them throughout the game, you see how both you and they develop throughout the story. Though, even with me saying that, for mm -hmm. the most part, the bosses don't really change. Uh, some bosses like Blue Blanc or Walter, who you fought in game two, will get new moves and abilities due to the engine change between games. But anyone who's played Cold cool. Steel on its own knows that, for the most part, characters don't really gain any new abilities between fights. They might gain a mech or a new form that gives them new abilities, but that's pretty rare. Of course, Ouch. if I were to mention a specific boss, I'd like to talk about McBurn. Currently, he is, I think, the most fought boss in the series at nine-ish times. You find him twice nine. in Cold Steel 2, four-ish times in Cold 3, and three-ish times in Cold Steel 4. Never mind fights with him with oh, Reverie, 64. which I won't spoil because it comes out in July. McBurn is a powerful know. adversary and probably the most powerful individual fighter that isn't a final boss shown so far. His flames are so strong that you need external magic protecting you just to fight him. Even the most powerful swordsman in the country got permanent lung damage from one encounter with him. 
One thing I do like about him compared to other bosses is his multiple forms. He is known as the Blazing Demon and can transform into one as you fight him. This includes the fight with him in Cold Steel 3 on top of Stargazer's Tower, or the final fight with his true Demon King form in the final dungeon of Cold Steel 4. And each form brings new attacks and even a new status effect to worry about when fighting him. The problem here and most story important bosses Cold Steel 4 would have is that um, most of them are forced loss fights, and that can get really annoying considering how easily you can break these games. <laughs> well, you say you wiped the floor with that enemy without taking damage? You lost! That's just how strong and cool your enemies are! <laughs> yeah, and as you can guess, Nick Burn is the literal embodiment of that. Out of the nine times you fight him, the only non-forced loss fights are the final fights in Cold Steel 2, the final fight in Cold Steel 3, and his later two fights in 4. And yeah, you can really? literally no damage these fights. One of my co-writers did this in Cold Steel 2 and 3, and these are turn-based RPGs. Too long didn't watch. Trails has a million bosses that you fight throughout the whole series multiple times, and the only reason that's at number 10 is more quantity than quality. Just be glad I didn't spend the entire entry <laughs> complaining about Gilbert. Do late. Yeah, the three Trails fans in my audience will get that one. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. No one's actually thinking about live streaming that, but yeesh, 60 hours, I'm good. Observe you so I can find out your weaknesses so I can eventually chop your head off and eat your skin and wear your bones like a hat. We're talking about Monster Hunter. Ooh. This is a franchise filled with a massive array of, well, monsters. Monsters, yeah. Every shape and size. Among them, the most prolific is easily Rathalos. Don't be surprised about this. Debuting all the way back in the first game, Rathalos is essentially the mascot of the franchise. Typically, you usually fight on True, the I mean, end he's in Smash Bros. Moment. You got the face in here. In terms of story, Monster Hunter doesn't really focus too much on it, but it does have lore. <laughs> it's said that the birth of Rathalos is be an omen right? of destruction. This comes into play during stories where a Rathalos you raise becomes a boss. Oh, now I'm sad. As a flying mm. wyvern, Rathalos' attacks consist of staying out of your attack range and breathing fire. Better whip out those flash bombs. And while this debatably counts, Rathalos also has a ton of variants. Dread King, Silver. Zenith, Flame, Destruction Wyvern, and the list goes on. Keep it up, and you might get as many versions of Street Fighter 2. <laughs> oh, wait, these are both Capcom properties. I probably shouldn't encourage them. The only real thing keeping Rathalos from being <laughs> high on the list is that the fights with them... Haven't really changed much over the years. Like for a franchise that's evolved as much as Monster Hunter, Rathalos, it's like so your character has stayed pretty much the same. Still, still, you gotta admire a boss so prolific that it escapes to other franchises. Well, duh, See? he was in Smash Bros. Ultimate. Yeah. Well, did you know he was in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker? Really? Either. Peace Walker. Huh. Oh no. <laughs> well, me. Am I right? Paper Mario is a series Ooh. filled with plenty of memorable characters, mm. or rather, was. Among them, yeah, well. two of the funniest Sorry. are Junior Troopa and Lord Crump. Both of them more or less huh. fill the rival role to Mario. Throughout both games, you see them repeatedly show up to challenge you. Yeah, you find <laughs> them quite a bit. I told up 10 times between both games. Yet, they never become actively annoying. Why? Well, for starters, their personalities. Right, Junior right, Troopa right. is a whiny little kid with an increasingly petty grudge against Mario. He's got some major Pokemon Blue energy. He's also relentless to the point of it being kind of admirable. Despite you constantly wiping the floor with him, he refuses to accept defeat. Not even having to cross the ocean and back will slow him down. When the Koopa Bros mm -hmm. return to challenge you in the final chapter, he pushes them aside for one more battle. He has Damn. no relevance in the story, yet he will not let you forget you him. The only way this joke would be better is if you fought him after the credits rolled. And then there's <laughs> Lord Crump. He's the second in command of the Keynots. Yes, I'm calling them Keynots just to piss people off. And arguably yeah. does his job of being a villain better than Grotus. He's far more active a threat and is there from the very and beginning. Goofy. And despite being fairly incompetent, he can be legitimately threatening when he wants to. Also, I gotta point out how the game acknowledges how blatantly obvious his disguise is. As for bosses, yeah. both Junior Troopa and Lord Crump are one of the first bosses you face as well as one of the last. They repeatedly learn all kinds of new tricks, so it really feels like they're actively learning alongside the player. Crump in particular deserves praise for weaponizing the audience against you. Without really? fun and memorable these two were, their showing up became less of an annoyance and more of something I joke. actively looked forward to. 
I make a quip about the characters in the newer games being bad, but that horse has long since decomposed. This one's got your name on it. Damn. Missed. Good thing this one has your name on it. Okay, Damn. I'm pretty sure this one has your... What the hell yeah, is okay. your name anyway? <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, fair enough. <laughs> you gotta love it sometimes, you know? I mean, like I said, you never know what's gonna happen, so... Ugh. Alright, move along. For seven. Ew, boy. Final, Final Fantasy. Fantasy. It shouldn't be surprising that from being one of the largest RPG series in the world, there'll be a few bosses here that you will fight <laughs> over and over and over for the sake of fan service. Why well, could I go the easier and just say Bahamut or Sephiroth? We need more pizzazz. We need more swords. We need more guns. We need more. Gilgamesh. Yeah, you may not realize this, but you actually fight Gilgamesh more than you think throughout the series. Starting really? at five, he is a major antagonist and right hand of X Death. Throughout the game, you fight him at least five times, and each time he gets a bit tougher. Despite hmm. being a major force, he actually starts to respect you, and by the end of the game, he will actually sacrifice himself to help you out. Though this also starts a new trend of Gilgamesh hopping dimensions to find Bart's. Eh. The next most notable Gilgamesh appearance is in 14, where he plays a prominent role in the Hildebrand storyline, acting as a recurring villain. You fight him three times here, once in a battle on the Big Bridge homage, once with Enkidu, and the other time where he acts as Yojimbo. Though if he is Yojimbo, you actually fight him four times, so let's not think about that. As yeah. for the others, you fight him in Final Fantasy 1 in a bonus dungeon, Final Fantasy 4, the after years in the final dungeon, Final Fantasy 6 in the Dragon's Deck Coliseum, Final Fantasy 8 in Lunatic Pandora if you got Odin Pryor, Final Fantasy 12 as an elite mark, Final Fantasy 12 for Evident Wings as a super boss, Final Fantasy 13 2 as a DLC boss, Final Fantasy 15 in Episode Gladiolas, and... <gasps> Breathe, dude. Breathe. Dang, that's a lot. I probably missed some, too. Ugh. For most of these, it's usually the same deal. He has a giant ego, he wants to collect everyone's weapons, and he dimension hops for some reason. Okay. He uses multiple weapons from all over the series and transforms into a stronger version of himself halfway through the fight, yada yada. Despite having such a yeah, big so ego and the game saying he's yeah. just inflating his skills, he actually has the beef to back up a lot of what he says. Okay, sure, Pretty he much. isn't the greatest swordsman in all realms, but he still acts as a super boss or end game boss in a good deal of modern games. Final Fantasy V aside, if you ever fought Gilgamesh in 13-2 or in Revenant Wings, you know how hard he can actually be. While Bahamut may have uh, worked better, Gilgamesh's mm -hmm. personality and overall awesome made him stand out far more among other recurring bosses in the series. And no amount of butchering done in Final Fantasy XV would have been able to change that. Thank you. Huh. Number six. Battles against the arch nemesis tend to get so many rematches that they span across an entire series, hence we had to disqualify oh. most of them. But there are uh. some that stand out really well no matter what game they're from, providing an experience mm -hmm. that gradually develops to keep every confrontation mm. interesting. One such really? example is Metroid's Ridley. own Ridley. Ridley. <laughs> With okay. all the adversaries that Samus takes down time and time again, Meta none Meta of which Ridley, matches the Meta tenacity Ridley, of the Mecha Space Ridley. Pirate's mighty oh, captain. You know what's up. Given the history of taking Samus' parents away from her, he has essentially become a lingering trauma that plagues her entire life. Returning from the dead time and time again, whether via mechanization, cloning, or mutation, and through Pretty all much. of it, maintains his ferocity, intelligence, and bloodthirst to smite his nemesis. Ridley's fights Pretty in the much. early days aren't too complicated. Which surprisingly, he just flies don't around see one it. Room dread, fireballs like, at yeah. Samus. While occasionally with dread, his tail end. Despite this, Ridley. he's still pretty threatening considering how big he is, making it tricky to avoid his every move. It was a blessing and a curse for the guy, to say the least. Yeah, In other games, fail. however, <laughs> his battles got more complex. Prime <laughs> gave us Meta Ridley, who we fight as he attacks from the sky and on ground level. His metallic armor makes hitting him in rapid succession a no-go, so you gotta play it smartier. And Prime 3 gives us an 
epic rematch as Ridley drags Samus Ooh, down a she... shaft where the two tear into each other until one of them can do no more but drop. You give him an awesome finisher, and from there, he comes back in the form of Omega, Omega Ridley. His bulk puts his previous <laughs> iterations to Ridley. shame, and he even comes packing with flamethrowers, shockwaves, and Energy Balls! And for his most recent outing, not chronologically, we had the Samus Returns fight, where Ridley and Samus wrestled the baby Metroid from each other in a surprise final fight. Sure, it's mostly there for fan service, but I am not, not caring. Don't care. It retconned nothing. Thing and it's awesome. Yeah. Let me have this. It's great to see how yeah. Ridley's fights stay consistently exciting every time. They could have easily made every fight play out like the Super Metroid one, but they go out of the way to nope. push the limits of how cinematic a battle against an edgy space pterodactyl can really go. Whatever excuse the devs might have he to bring it dragon, back again, but, I'll uh, be looking forward to yeehaw. another duel just as engrossing as the rest. I guess we'll see you on four. I think that's the next Metroid game, but we'll see. Once you've taken your first hey, clumsy step on your Pokemon journey, there's always one recurring force that pushes you to be at the top of your game, <laughs> your rival. Your almost perfect parallel following their own path to greatness. They could be your best buddy, your annoying best buddy, the champion's relative, a shonen protag, or even the hero in their own story. What hey, matters Wally. is their journey almost always parallels Ooh, yours. Ours. You'll come across them more than once along the way just to see if your skills are still as sharp as ever. Honestly, any <laughs> one of these guys could fit right in with this list, but there are two in particular <laughs> I two. really want to give a shout Blue out to. And, and those two are... Gary was here. <laughs> Loser! Gary. Yep, we're giving up to the OG rivals of the series, blue. Red and Blue. Both were chosen by Professor Oak to embark on a journey to record all Pokemon in the Kanto region. Both their quests culminating in one final championship battle. But what makes them both perfect for this list? Well, let's take a look at them, shall we? From the beginning, Blue is and has been a cocky little punk. Ambitious to be the best of the best and almost always one step ahead of us in the most irritating sense. Of all the rivals in the series, Blue's the one we fight the most. Eight to nine battles in the first gen alone. Adding to it, while we were both on the same journey, he finished it first. He beat all the gym leaders before we did. He beat the lead four before we did. He won. He took the championship crown while we were probably getting lost in Victory Road trying to avoid all those freaking Zubats. And even after we dethrone him, he's still not through with us. He just moves on to become the Viridian City gym leader. Okay, mm -hmm. I gotta admit that he's got a pretty nice resume under his belt. And that even after that, he still keeps popping back up in later gens. So when he says, <laughs> smell you later, he ain't kidding. And then there's Red. Okay, yeah, I know it feels weird putting him here since he's a protagonist. We've lived his entire Pokemon journey, and we pointed him down the path to becoming the champion of the Indigo Plateau. But once you follow another trainer's story, he hey, becomes hey, one of your greatest challenges of the time. The true final boss of Gen 2 stalked with a powerhouse team. But why is he a recurring boss? Same reason Blue is. He yeah, keeps making comebacks four, five, even past Gen, Gen 2, and he's almost... Always a super boss. It's also cool that he's the only main character in the franchise you fight. Unless you're playing Pokemon Masters. Then you get your choice uh, to brawl with all the heroes. Yay. It's kind of fitting to put both Gen 1 rivals together in one entry since they were essential to each other's growth as trainers. And, our and growth, even to be after honest. their stories are done, they'll still keep popping back up to test the latest generation to make sure they aren't going soft. I mean, one became a freaking gym leader and the other is a god among trainers. So not really Pretty a much. comparison, don't you think? Hey, wrong. That does feel like a challenge towards us too. There are rivals. Having your rival constantly pester you is bad enough, but what if said rival was your own Virgil. brother? Boy, Thanksgiving must be awkward in the Sparta household. Meet Virgil, Dante's twin brother. When their mom <laughs> died, Virgil decided, Screw humanity, I'm gonna go full demon with blackjacks and katanas. So simply put, he's your biggest rival. But the way he keeps popping up throughout the Devil May Cry series, he might as well be the main baddie. Let's take a look, chronologically. Shall we? Since Devil May Cry 3 is actually a prequel to numbers 1 through 5, we'll start there. In Dante's Awakening, Virgil acts as the big bad trying to open a door to the demon world to acquire more power. 
we get in his way at least three times before he finally yeets himself out of existence. Then we come Thanks, to the Virgil. original Devil May Cry where Virgil is brought back, but entrapped in demonic armor and dubbed Nello Angelo. Yes, this counts because it's still him behind the suit. This time around, we don't know it's him and he's acting as the enforcer for the demon that gave him new life and enslaved him. Oops. Once again, we clash with him three times Bye, before finally doing away with him and finding out, oh dang, we killed our early twin. Oops. Again. Uh, guess what? The fun yeah. Will never end. yeah, about that death thing. If a character's popular, it's usually more of a suggestion, if anything. Yeah. <laughs> Virgil's back again no by time. Devil May Cry 5. This time having been split in half. V. His human half being V and his demon half, Yurizen. If I Yurizen five Yurizen. times, but I don't know. Do we really count those? I mean, yeah, technically he is part of Virgil, but at the same time, he's not actually him. So I don't know. No, no. For a series that loves its red and black, I'm seeing a lot of gray here. V acts mm -hmm. as secondary protagonist, and eventually he and Yurizen come back together to restore Virgil. Virgil is more determined than ever to settle the score with his twin. You do get to fight the actual Virgil twice here. Once as Dante, and once as his own son, Nero. Nero. Wow, the family drama knows no limits. Without taking Yurizen mm -hmm. into consideration, this little family skirmish goes on for eight grueling brawls. But of all the little okay. family spats with Virgil, which ones really stand out the most? Great. Our duel of them at the end of DMC3 has been dubbed one of the series' best fights, and I can't disagree. Their conflict has been built up throughout the entire game, really laying the groundwork for all their future encounters. At the end of the game, it pays off in a grand spectacle as the two are evenly matched, catching each other blow by blow. And in the end, even after all they've been through, Dante still had a sliver of hope for saving his brother. But Virgil ain't giving him the satisfaction. The other big highlight is the yep. final brawl in Devil May Cry 5. At the time of this video, this is the most recent DMC title in the series. So for now, this is the big end game brawl. With Virgil back in one piece, he and his twin vow to end this once and for all. But Nero steps in to put an end to the sibling rivalry. And he kicks his dad's butt. Can you blame him? This little family squall has been going on for too long and you're ruining Christmas, dad! Thankfully, this does <laughs> have a so. happy ending, with the two making peace and saving the world, and they're free to spar in the underworld as frenemies. With how long they've been going it's at it, jackpot. can't think of a more poetic ending. Also, did anyone else notice that, you know, Dante's kind of look like the uh, metal guy from Resident Evil 8? I, I can't help but notice, he's got the hair for it. <laughs> Just give him some metal powers. Bada boom, bada bing, he's right there. <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember the name. It's been a while. Anywho, so we're down to the final three. So I wonder how many people, how many times they reoccur these next three bosses. You know what I mean, right? The everlasting rivalry Tip between a roll. hero and their arch enemy remains one of the greatest gaming tropes. It really highlights the importance of the two as recognizable pillars in their respective series and became such an accepted status quo mm -hmm. that most would rather not challenge. However, some do challenge it. So not many of them came out on top, wrong. but those who do would prove to be something of a legend. A legend paved a by Didi. a king! Oh, yo, that's essentially a good point. You fight him a lot. Compared and to Nintendo's hard-hitting nemeses like Bowser, Ganon, Ridley, and K. Rule, DDD is pretty tame. He just goes around stealing food or mildly bothering Kirby every so often. He rarely puts up a fight of his own against Kirby and helps him reluctantly even. Considering some people knew DDD is an enjoyably persistent bully in the anime, they were probably hoping to get something similar in the games, but no such case. Despite all that, how did DDD make it work when all the others did it? Well, in Revenge of the King, we do see Kirby versus DDD at its finest. DDD amps up the toughness of his army to really bring Kirby down for good, even going as far as to summon Cabula to take Kirby down mid-air. And when you finally face DDD, he ain't yes, messing dude. around anymore. Taking a page from Meta Knight, he dons a mask and challenges Kirby to a hammer duel. He's ready to annihilate Kirby with rockets, flamethrowers, and a devastating hammer spin. He'll even knock Kirby into the electric fence, which can cause him to lose his ability immediately. And when you finally Eesh. beat Mastini, he lost his spirit. He gave everything he could, but he still, still couldn't lost. beat Kirby. 
Despite that, he still has the support of his minions who stuck around with him to the end. With how much experience DDD gained, and for the sole motivation he still has to keep going, it's possible we might see a newer, better DDD flourish in the future. And boy, oh, did he. Sure, he started up slow, trying to seal Nightmare away, only to waste time swimming in the fountain like an idiot. But he did mature Oops. later on, no. as he aids Kirby to give chase to the Squeak Squad and remains a prominent ally in the battles against Dark Matter, Magalorian Highness. When you fight him sure. again, it wasn't even out of spite, but DDD himself Toronto. was controlled into doing so. Triple Deluxe shows how much stronger he's gotten than ever before. Not only do you get a rematch against Mass DDD, but he begins to sport a oh. giant battle axe to whack you around with. Gets even crazier in the Shadow DDD fight, which has shadowy attacks emerging from his belly as a callback to his possessed fights in Dreamland yes. and 64. But I think we know which Ooh. battles really show DDD is best. The Forgotten Dying Land Blast. fights. Under the spell Yo. Effecto Forgo, DDD has command over the Beast Pack on his side, as well as a slew of new powerful attacks like massive shockwaves, hurling an entire pillar at you, and even ice powers. The rematch <laughs> against Forgo, DDD swaps the ice with bustling flames and lava, climaxing to yeah. DDD's feral rage as he uh. hunts Kirby down like a boar. It's telling just how far he's come when he puts his life on the line to protect a single Waddle D. The king has long grown from abusing his power to defeat Kirby out of pride and has become someone who truly cares and fights for his people. Now that's character development. But for mm. those who still reminisce about the old days when DDD was an antagonist, we still got Battle Royale and Fighters 2. The former features DDD as the host and final boss, while the latter has him teaming up with Meta Knight in a true Four showdown corners. of rivals. It's not nice. hard to see how much people's respect for DDD shot up over the past few years. The big old penguin has evolved so much for the better that no one really questions his role as Kirby's nemesis anymore, as he's far more than that. Though it is a True. bit weird, he still wears that title on his sleeve. Eh, regardless, <laughs> no stopping him from being the ally Kirby needs, as well as an adversary that truly challenges them where it counts. May the Amen. king of Dreamland prosper forevermore! Amen. Definitely king we can all get behind. So if Eggman's out of the question, what other mm -hmm. villain could be considered the most fought baddie in the Sonic franchise? Oh, wait, I know this one. It's obviously Shadow, right? Yeah, not really. No. Yeah, Shadow Sonic have butted heads plenty of times, but can you really call him the most fought villain next to Eggman himself? So, mm -mm -mm. not him, then who? Seems like we might be due for a big old storm of chaos. <laughs> yep, we're oh, talking yeah. about this water chaos. gremlin again, Chaos. Originally the oh, yeah, Guardian of the Chaos Emeralds, he was unleashed by Eggman game. in another harebrained world domination scheme and ended up being the most recurring <laughs> boss in Sonic Adventure. You do battle yeah. with him, Five times in that game alone. Four times as Sonic. Three as Knuckles. One as Tails. And ugh. wait, big. So oh, you get that one. Chaos is literally the only reason to justify playing as Big the Cat. And in a neat twist, and every brawl features Chaos in a different form. Each one based on how much negative energy he's absorbed from the Chaos Emeralds. His basic form emeralds, is pretty yes. basic. Walking ball of water that can pinwheel you. Chaos 2 is taller and more beastly. Chaos 4 is a big old ferocious dolphin on the hunt. Chaos 6 kind of looks like I tried to audition to be a xenomorph. Either way, <laughs> nope. Kind of does. And then there's, there's his perfect final chaos. evolution. Yeah. Perfect chaos. The ultimate culmination of all the Chaos Emeralds. A city-destroying liquid kaiju. And honestly, my all-time favorite Sonic boss. He is the <laughs> only boss in the game you fight as Super Sonic, and they made it all worth it with a monumental clash accompanied yeah. by Open Your Heart as the battle theme. Yeah, for the first half, anyway. Why couldn't they keep that going in the second half? It's the perfect fight music, dang it! You can't always get what you want, bro. Ain't that the truth? Jokes aside, Thank Chaos' is Remy's Remy doesn't end there. Emerald True. gets a crack at him in Sonic Battle, where you learn to copy his abilities. Sonic does battle against Perfect Chaos again in Generations, Nations. but this time as regular Sonic. I really like this detail because it shows how much the Blue Hedgehog's grown Ooh. since their last tussle. Heck, even LEGO Dimensions brings wow. him back. That alone shows how much staying power Chaos has for the franchise. Wait, wasn't he a voice? Speaking of LEGOs, I'm not saying they should do more with this series, but... <laughs> Consider... <laughs> Fair enough. But first, honorable mentions. Goromajima, Yakuza. Hey, Majima. Madam Somachika is on mechanic system. 
Dracula, Castlevania. Dracula. Unlike the disqualified villains, we at least have an in-story justification for why he reappears. Ah. Zaggy, Tales of Vesperia. Very Zaggy? convincing sanity slippage as he reappears. Mala, Xenoblade. Both the first boss and the final boss. Xehanort hmm. slash Dark Riku slash Riku, Kingdom Hearts. Well, it's technicalities Xehanort. aside, the quality of these fights really vary. The four oh. hounds, Fire Emblem and Gage. They work together to beat you down with the emblem rings. It's one of the only good parts of the story. Womp womp. And the number one recurring boss is... So you might be wondering... What game could possibly have a fight that surpasses the tenacity of an all-powerful entity of destruction? Ring fit? The hell? Eh? Huh? Yes, I am dead serious. Ring Fit Adventure, an RPG where you fight by squatting your thighs off, is home to the most persistent boss you'll ever come across. Throughout the game, you traverse the land to give chase of an evil incarnate of excessive bodybuilding, Drago. Drago, once upon a time, was a well-intentioned dragon who trained with his friend Ring and built a bunch of stadiums under the belief that everyone should be able to exercise. But through the influence of toxic masculinity, he trained so hard that he put the whole land in danger of his power, so he had to be sealed away. It's not until the player releases him to begin the game's plot does he get to continue his terrifying reign of lying around in stadiums and exercising vigorously. Nahara! <laughs> it's gruesome! Hide me! As you reach the stadium and face off against Rago, you combat him with the exercises you learned all across your adventure. Drago will also attack you with his own, but would also pause between turns to flex. Mark out. Okay. Almost basically wish this was punch out. The more you fight him throughout the game, you'll gather new and stronger attacks, but so does he. You'll summon minions to heal him or buff his attacks, fire laser beams, take different forms, debuff you, and even starts to pause less and less between turns, showing how much he's starting to take you seriously. Damn. In some fights, he even has weapons that can deal a ton of damage okay, if you barbells. don't take them down. Yeah, those dumbbells have health bars. The Damn. beef on this cake knows no bounds. Finally, there's the last showdown against Dark Drago. He sports three health bars this time, each representing a different set of skills. His attacks really bite this time, and he even brings back each and every different skill he gained throughout the game, making this the ultimate challenge against your gamer and literal muscles. So Damn. with all these new forms and additions, how many times do you fight him exactly? Well, as it huh? seems, you fight him 16 times through the main story and 33 times, including post-game. Let me rephrase. Wait, that's 49 times. You fight times. Drago in one game more than you fight Ganon across a 30-year-old game franchise. It just don't it doesn't make up. It up. And yet, despite all of that, the fights never got old. Why? Well, because for each time you're fighting him, you're getting some well-regulated exercise. The fights do a good job motivating you to maintain the routine and highlight each important muscle to work out. What other boss fight helps you get healthier the more you fight it? Of course, you <laughs> shouldn't push your luck, especially since Drago himself is the embodiment of working out too hard. All that endless muscle building, yet it doesn't stop him from getting pummeled every so often. It's important mm -hmm. to keep in mind that there can always be too much of a good thing, and fighting True. Drago demonstrates it well. Working out is a good routine for all, but you gotta maintain a healthy regulation for your muscles and stamina to grow, and not overdo it lest you risk burning out and losing more than what you gain. It's by understanding your limits and performing at your best that you'll be able to knock out this husky salamander time and time again. Damn. Oh, and now I kind of want to play Ring Fit. Anyone else? I'm what Josh Crusher, and Hold boy, is this workout doing some good for my muscles. I'll be useful for the next countdown. Interesting. There are over 100 billion cells in the human brain, and yet all of yours failed to understand. One simple concept. Meep. Brain always beats brawn. Cut! So, 
smart bosses? Wait, didn't you do that? Or are we going computer bosses? I don't know. <laughs> I guess we'll see that on April 1st. But for now, that's going to be it for me. Thanks for watching, everybody. Till next time, like Scott for more. Adios.